For 19 electrifying seasons, my guest tonight displayed a flair and style that the world of baseball had never seen. After getting drafted by the San Diego Padres in 1977, Osborne Earl Smith went on to become the greatest defensive shortstop in the history of the game, winning a record 13 straight gold gloves, playing in 15 All-Star games, and winning the 1982 World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals. But before he was inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame, did you know he lived through the Watts riots of 1965, went to college on an academic scholarship, learned his signature acrobatics as a kid at a nearby lumberyard. Tonight we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, I wanted people to respect me the way I respected the game. Please welcome the wizard, Ozzie Smith. A standing O to start. We're coming out hot. <laughs> We're coming out hot. Hold on a second. Oh, no, I, I better not. <laughs> you, you're not going to do any backflips today? No, not intentionally, Joe. Okay, no. good. In all disclosure, uh, I've known Ozzy since I was a little kid, since I was 12. Yeah, but it's not. A little snot. A little snot. <laughs> and I had you check that before we walked out here, and I appreciate it. Uh, no, I, we're going to get into the first day that you spent in St. Louis, which was with my dad for a portion of it as we get on in, in your life and in your career. But there's so much that I didn't know about you and about your life, and it's fascinating to me because being born in Mobile, Alabama, living through the Jim Crow South, the early years of your life, being the second of six, tell me about life as a young Osborne Earl Smith. Well, you know, uh, as you said, you know, a lot of the, the early days uh, living in the South there, um, I don't remember a lot of that. But I remember coming to Los Angeles and growing up in an area whereby there was always, there was always danger. And my mom always tried to protect us from that. But in 1963, uh, when we moved here, Los Angeles at that time uh, was very gang infested. You know, so we were always kind of protected from that. And one thing that was always preached by my mom was that it's important for you to get a good education. You had to go to school, making sure that I became whatever I chose to do to be the very best that I could be. Whatever that was, if that was a sanitation engineer, be the very best that you could be. If I wanted to play sports, I had to make sure that I, I did my homework and I had to make sure that I, I washed the dishes on the days that I was scheduled to wash dishes. And so um, 1965, of course, the riots. I, I don't know that people of a certain age, I was born in 1969, so four years after the Watts riots of 1965. It was over 50 square miles. miles. This was a large area of Los Angeles and 34 deaths. And yeah. I mean, we, this was we, scary. Yeah, we lived across the street from Manchester Recreation Center, and that's where the National Guard set up camp. And, and you're nine. And I'm nine years old. And watching them march up and down the street and having to sleep on the floor was one of the scariest things. And, and through the night, you could hear gunshots and the, the fire trucks and the ambulances and all of that stuff going. And that was, real, that, that was real scary for a young kid growing up and not knowing exactly how that was going to end up. And you're sleeping on the floor because you want to avoid bullets mm -hmm. po potentially coming through a window. Uh, I think as it was for us, we only had one relative that, we, that lost his life during the, the, the rioting. And, and stuff, but uh, that was very, that was a scary time for, for all of us. I was so young at that time that you really didn't understand it, but as I got older and things started to settle, settle down a little bit and we were able to get back to what we would consider normalcy, um, people talk about being poor. They didn't really know what poor was because for whatever reasons, my mom and my dad, um, they always, they, we always had a roof over our head and food on the table. And it, we, we weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination, but we had the things that we needed. And my goal was always to be the very best. And this was instilled in us as young kids. And, I, and, and it goes back to my mom, uh, because uh, around 13, 14, my, they separated. So as is the case with most black athletes, you're raised by a single parent. And my mom had um, 
My, she was no different than anybody else. She worked extremely hard to try and make sure that her kids had the things that they needed in life. And She worked in a nursing home. I'm, I'm sure she worked hard, long hours. You know, you, you know Joe, let me, let, me, let me say, as I look back, I can remember nights or, or days of when my mom would come in late, tired, but she still fixed us dinner. Um, it was always there on the table. Um, when I needed a little extra money, it was always there. I don't know how she could take a penny and stretch it the way she did, but she did. I, I never felt that I went without. And so it was all about making sure that I became whatever I chose to do to be the very best that I could be. Whatever that was, if that was a sanitation engineer, be the very best that you could be. And these were the things that I took out into the world, you know, understanding that I was only going to get out of something what I put in it. If I didn't put anything in it, then I shouldn't expect anything in return. And, and with that philosophy, you know, I, I've, I went through my life. When did you first get introduced to baseball? I had an uncle who, when I was a little kid, I can remember very vaguely, he had this little plastic ball, and I can remember starting to hit, hit that ball and, and throw the ball. And he, he told my mom, he says, you know what, that, he's got a good arm on him. He has a good arm on me. I, I, th that's part of the... So the, you're younger the, than nine. Oh, yeah. It, this is when I'm a little kid. So, you know, that's, that was really when I started, you know, as far as hand and eye coordination was concerned. You know, he used to throw that little plastic ball to me, and, and I used to hit it, and we used to hit pecans, and that was the beginning. You become a relentless practicer, bouncing a ball, playing so. Annie Annie over and mm -hmm. throwing the ball over the roof. We a, yeah, we had a peak roof. So I was always fast because I was a little guy. And when you're a little guy, you got you to be faster, you got to do it better and so forth. And so for me, I used to throw the ball on the, over the roof, hoping that it hits the gutter before it hits the ground. And I thought I was fast enough to run around to the other side and catch it before it hit the ground. Now. The question is, did you ever get there? No, I never got there, but it was that type of determination that ultimately made me and developed the, the determination stuff that I, that I ended up with. Your childhood, I, I talked to your brother, Fred, mm -hmm. who, by the way, sounds exactly like you. Uh, <laughs> I look better, though. Okay. <laughs> he, he actually didn't agree with that part. <laughs> the way you two grew up, I mean, you were kind of creating your own fun. And he said, you know what we loved? We loved to watch wrestling. Yeah. Two yeah. guys he mentioned, Mr. Moto. <laughs> yes. And Edward Carpentier. Edward Carpentier. Edward Carpentier was the guy who did the backflip off of the top rope. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm not sure that that was the reason that, that I started tumbling. But it was one of those things that, that always was in, etched in, our, in, my, in my mind, anyway, because that was, was a fascinating art form, well, learning yeah. to tumble. And, and ironically enough, you lived across from a lumber yard, mm -hmm. and so you would go with Fred, your brother, and you guys were doing flips off. Playing I, into sawdust. Yeah, yeah, into sawdust piles. That was your landing as, as young Ozzy was flying through the air. Yeah, we'd take uh, old inner tubes from big tires, and I'd, we'd have guys that sit on the side of it, and you could use that as a springboard, or you could take a, a plank of wood and put it between the, the pallets, and that would be a springboard. And then on Thursdays, we used to go to what they call family fun centers, where they had the trampolines in the ground. And I would tumble from one trampoline to the flip, from one trampoline to the other, as a crazy kid over that concrete. Fred would travel with you to Dodger Stadium. Yeah. And you would sit there and look at these players. And he said, the two of us, you and your brother Fred, would say someday, one of us is going to be down there. That was part of our, our youth, growing up and sitting there and, and, and watching all the greats that, that came in to play at Dodger Stadium and, and our desire, both of us. And one day, I don't know exactly where it came from, I got an old glove, a real glove. And that became, that became my best friend. And so I used, to, I used to sleep with that under my pillow. And I can remember the first time that I joined the team and I didn't have any stirrups. So my mom um, was coming home from work. and Those I, I are the wear. socks that go it's over the white, the white socks. socks. I can remember waiting for her because she was going to stop by the sporting goods store and get my stirrups. See, because back then, that uniform meant so much. You put, 
creases in your uniform. You know, you earned the uniform. You, you had a crease in it, and uh, you had to look good. Because if you, if you didn't play good, you had to look good. Right. And so we took a lot of pride in, um, in the way that we went out there. And my uniform was always clean when I started, but it was to, to, to prove that, you know, I had been working. It had to be dirty when I was done, you know. So I had to dive and slide and all of that stuff. But that, that was a very special time in my life uh, when, I, when I first got a chance to join a team and, and, and started playing and waiting for those stirrups. Yeah, it's, it's funny that that sticks out to you because that's a common theme with people who have sat in that seat that kids, no matter where they come from, once they put that uniform, that uniform was like kind of the the superhero cape, or that was, I'm, I'm done with that part of my life right now. Once this thing comes on, yeah. I'm, I'm... You're a different person. You're different. It's, it's a personality, a different personality um, comes out. It's that competitive thing that w either you're born with it or you're not. And I, I think part of what we talked about earlier, my mom instilling the fact that you got to work hard and be the very best that you can be. And that's always running around in my mind and, and stuff. So I worked extremely hard at, at being the very best baseball player that I could be. And being a smaller guy, you had to work a little bit harder at it if you were going to be successful against the, the, the bigger guys. In high school, I was probably 135, 140 pounds. But I had the opportunity to play with Eddie Murray in high school. And when you play with a guy like Eddie Murray, when scouts come out, they're not looking at a 135-pound guy running around as shortstop. You were, you were flat out overlooked. Well, you know, I, I, I guess that's the best way to put it, overlooked. Um, Being overlooked had to just be the it ultimate drove, of frustration. It, 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 was, it was a thing that drove me because it was always, well, you're too small. You're too small. And, and, and my mom used to say, you know, it, it's, it's not how big you are, it's how big your heart is. You know, you've got to be willing to put forth the effort, and you can do whatever you put your mind to. So with that, I just continued to, to work hard. I used that as my driving force. But when people said I couldn't, I said, you know what? I can, and I will, if given the opportunity. Was baseball your way out? Did you look at it that way? For most of us as, as black athletes, if we don't make it, our family don't make it. So that's part of the, the responsibility that comes with um, being who we, who we are or who we become. And so f for me, failure was not an option because I know that if I fail, they fail. You get a, an, a, an academic scholarship to Cal Poly. Yeah, because I, I had done what my mom told me to do to make sure that I get a good education. I work hard in school. And so I was a walk-on to the baseball team. They gave me that opportunity. And, at that point, that's all I was looking for, was the opportunity. The varsity shortstop gets hurt. Breaks his leg, break, I think. Broke his leg or ankle, and I stepped in, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's one of those unbelievable things that happened. That it, one of those unbelievable things that happened along the way that you, you never know when that opportunity is going to present itself, because that window of opportunity may be very, very small. And it's what I tell my kids and all the kids that I speak to is that window of opportunity. When you get that window of opportunity, you've got to be ready to step through it. And when that opportunity presented itself, I had prepared myself enough that I was ready to step through it and I knew that uh, my time had come. It worked out because in 1976, I ended up getting drafted by the Detroit Tigers. They offered me $8,500 and they were going to send me to Lakeland, Florida. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to them, and I'm saying, well, wow, $8,500. I said, God, I need at least 10 grand. If they, if they give me 10 grand, I think it's worth the, uh, worth the chance. So I went back to them, and they said, no, we don't have that in our budget. So I promised my mom that I was going to get my education, and I had finished three years of my schooling. So I went back to school in hopes of getting drafted again my senior year, which I did by the San Diego Padres. And being the good businessman that I am, Joe, I signed for $5,000 a bus <laughs> ticket to Walla Walla, Washington. I did. <laughs> Unbelievable. $5,000. And a Chrysler LeBaron. Yes, indeed. Oh, boy. What a car. Yes, I mean, it's that like was, winning it, it a game. It's like winning Family Feud yeah. or something. It, <laughs> it, was the first, it was the first time that I was able to buy a car on my own, you know? And... 
I, I'm in Walla Walla and I get my car and I'm driving it home. You know, I'm going to get a chance to drive home because when I drive up, everybody's going to be looking, you know. <laughs> I had Corinthian leather. Yeah, it was, of it course, was, yeah. It was, it, it was burgundy, and that was my baby. And so that, that, was, a, that was a special time in my life because I, I hadn't really made it to the, to, the, to the big show, but I was in the show. You're, the, you're a pro. I am a pro. So uh, I was very proud of what I accomplished at that, at that point in time, and I like that leather and the car so much I said huh it's got it does it get any better than this and I, and, and I figured that it did you know so I just continued to work hard at being that guy that could maybe one day drive a Cadillac you know go from a Chrysler LeBaron to a Cadillac and who knows after that you don't spend much time in the minor leagues I mean you you it's less than 100 games and you make the team out of spring training what are your goals at that point? Are, are you even in a position to make goals at that point? The first one would be making it to the big leagues and making it to the big leagues as a notably a defensive player is to win yourself a gold glove at some point in time, not knowing when that's going to happen. But that is, that is the number one goal because if you can't stand out for what you're there for, then why are you there? So that was, that was, that was goal number one. And then as, as time went on, my next goal was to get myself to a point to where, as a shortstop, I could win a Silver Slugger Award at some point in time. Which goes to the best hitter at that defensive position in each league. In each league. So I would imagine the Gold Glove is the obvious one. The Silver Slugger Award is the one that's going to take the most work. The most work. It's going to take, because coming into the big leagues, I had no real formal teaching as far as offense was concerned. You know, learning how to, to get myself to a point to where I'm hitting line drives on a consistent basis was what I had to learn. And I had to learn it against the likes of Nolan Ryan, Fergie Jenkins, Tom Seaver, Steve Carlton. The list goes on and on. And, and all but one of that list are right-handed. Right-hander, and they're all Hall of Famers. And, and you're trying to hit lefty off the righties. Right. And so with with the way that I was brought up and the way that I was taught was that you got to put in the work. And I felt that if there was no reason for me with the hand and eye coordination that I had for me not to be a better offensive player, I just had to get stronger and have a better understanding. So it, when I started understanding how to, how to level my swing out, things started, they started clicking and I had, had a better understanding of what I was trying to accomplish. Your rookie year, within two weeks of you being in the big leagues, this happens. One hop shot, diving play by Ozzy. Long throw, you wouldn't believe it. Mm. It's... <laughs> now, so, you know, it, it's hard in the room to see how incredible that play is because he's going to his left, the ball's in a spot, and it hits. What, yeah. a family of six? And <laughs> kicks over here. You know, I'm, I'm going, and as I dive, the ball hit, and it goes this way. So my momentum's going this way. The ball's going back this way. So the only way for me to get it was to reach, reach up with my bare hand. And lo and behold, it stuck. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's stuck, and I was able to scramble to my feet and and throw him out at first base. And I, I made a play, and, it, and I, it, really didn't, it really didn't dawn on me until the next morning when I woke up. I was listening to the radio, and the guy says, I think I saw the greatest play I've ever seen yesterday at the ballpark. And I said, well, this ball's been around a long time, and that's quite a statement uh, to be made. But um, it has it been called since then the greatest play, defensive play in the history of the game. Is it your greatest defensive play in your mind? That play, probably number one. There was another one that the tough, uh, tough plays are always ones where you got your back to the infield and you're, you're going out. I can like see that May. one in my mind, like, too. I... Like, a Willie, like Willie Mays made. You know, he only did that once. I did it every day. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. That was, I mean, that, that probably was the greatest play 
um, with I, where it was, with where it was in the and World and Series and, and, and series and stuff. So, you know, to to even be considered in this in, 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 in mentioned in the same breath as a, a play that Willie Mays made was was more than you know more than I could have ever imagined. As you look back, knowing what you know now, I mean, you finished second in the Rookie of the Year voting to Bob Horner mm -hmm. because of plays like that. From a defensive standpoint, to even garner that much attention s simply with your glove, it's, it's, it's just pretty special. Now that I look back on it, you know, when I was playing, I never gave a whole lot of thought to numbers. Because if you're an everyday player, you just, you go out to do your job every day. I want to do better today than I did yesterday. And all of that other stuff will take care of itself. 1980, you win your first gold glove. So you've gone from second in the Rookie of the Year voting, first gold glove. Now, there's a goal that you set out when you first started, and you've reached it within yeah. two years. Yeah, it feels pretty good, and boy, I'd, I'd like to do this again. Yeah. Uh, and it's contract time with the San Diego Padres during these years now. And the general manager of the Padres is you're looking for a new deal. The offer is for 60 grand. And his quote is, and this is paraphrasing, and the, the essence of it was, it's a lot of money for a black boy from Watts to turn down. That was a quote, yeah. That was it. I mean, it all comes full circle, you know. Um, it's, it's one of those things that's always there. I don't know how he looked at it, but that was, that's where we were at the time. Here's what you did. You and your agent, I think more your agent, the agent, put an ad in the San Diego Union Tribune in the classified section that said, professional athlete, willing to work, uh, looking for a part-time job. It has to fit around baseball hours. Yeah. yeah. As but we'll leave, we'll leave baseball for the right price, well, the no, right no, opportunity. No, I want to tell you what he did. He, he, he put in there that, uh, that I was going to go and, and run the tour, uh, drive, uh, ride the Tour de France. <laughs> I didn't even know what the hell the Tour de France was. <laughs> but but this, was the, this was the negotiation and stuff that was going on. But this became, this was an unusually public negotiation. First, the GM says what he says, which hits well, you well, hard. Let, let me say that it was it's Mrs. Croc, uh, Joan Croc, owner of the team. team, at the time actually says that she would go and talk to her head gardener and ask him if he had some opening. He said he'd work for, for three for fifty an, an hour. hour or something like that. Yeah. And so... Man, uh, did things go south quick. Well, with the organization it did, but I did not allow that to deter me from what my goal was. So I kept my head up. I kept moving forward. You and, signed uh, a one year. I signed a one year deal. $300,000 deal. deal. Yeah. Five times. Mm -hmm. With, with, importantly, a no trade clause in which there. Is, which, which not many three or four year players get. W was this, because that gives you a bit of a hammer there. I thought it, I thought it did, Joe. I yeah. thought it did. Until one day I got a call from a reporter in St. Louis saying, welcome to St. Louis. I go, I got a no trade clause. How, how, they haven't traded me. But it happened. So you have to be convinced by Whitey Herzog, who had just taken over as manager uh, the year before. You have to be convinced that this is the right move for Ozzie Smith. I am dying to ask you, <laughs> what did he tell you? Because... The Cardinals had not been good for a while now. They, everybody thinks the Cardinals, they were always this great team. They hadn't been. Whitey was creating a whole new way to play. Yep. And what did he tell you? Well, when we sat down there, he says, I am willing, if you come and play for the St. Louis Cardinals, he said, there's no reason that we can't win at all. He said, I think that you're the missing piece to this puzzle. He says, I'm willing to give you a one-year deal at $450,000. If at the end of the year you don't like St. Louis, you can become a free agent. And, and if you like it, then we'll sit down and talk about a long-term deal. And the man was the man of his word. And I, and I signed the deal.
What did your mom say or how proud was your mom? I mean, it was, I mean, that was a special time because all of the things that, that I've had, that we as a family had to deal with at that time, it meant that better times were on the way. And it's nice to be able to walk in and do something for your parents. You know, um, being able to not have to worry about the house payment, uh, where that next meal is going to come from, or even talk about having a vacation. You know, that's, that's something that we never, ever talked about. And then giving them the opportunity to travel to see me play was, that was it, man. It was a special time. Which leads me to this quote that's on the wall. I wanted people to respect me the way I respected the game. We have a lot of quotes on that wall with guests, and I, I can't think of a better quote that encapsulates somebody who's sitting in that chair than that for you. Because it, it's not just about the way you respected the game, but it's about you being respected as a human. As a human, because, you know, for young people, like young kids, and I have people ask me this all the time that have little kids that don't have a lot of size. You know, can you say something to them? What would you say to them? And, and, and I always say that, you know, you're only going to get out of something what you put in it. And if you don't put anything in, you shouldn't expect anything in return. And that's not, in, not only in sport, that's in life. And so if you're willing to put forth the work and the effort, only good can come from it. So let's just go through this real quick. You show up in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and you show up at my house. <laughs> my dad, who was the Cardinals announcer, was kind of taking you around yeah. at, when you first got to St. Louis. My dad loved Ozzy and, and I assume back the other way. Uh, did you like my dad? <laughs> let, me tell, let, me let me tell you guys, you know, I, I consider myself one of the luckiest people in the world because growing up in Southern California, I got to listen to Vin Scully growing up. And then I go, I leave Southern California and I go to St. Louis and I get to hear and visit with Mr. Jack Buck. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that really stands out, and I, and this is the kind of person he was. When we all struggle, you're going through a slump or whatever. He was always aware of having been around the game. He was always aware of the, he always said the right things. Some days when, when a guy was struggling, rather than put the mic in his face and talk to him, he, he'd walk by me and he'd go, keep your head up. <laughs> just, just keep walking, keep your head up. And it was always that type of encouragement that he gave, he gave everybody. I developed a very special relationship with his dad and uh, one of the greatest men that I've ever met and one of the most knowledgeable baseball people this game Thank has you. ever seen. Thank you, Oz. Thank yeah. you. Well. When you first got to St. Louis, Whitey Herzog and you had a little game going. Yeah, 1982. Every, every time you hit it in the air? I had to pay him a dollar. And every time I hit it on the ground, he paid me a dollar. Halfway during the season, he said, this is old. I learned very quickly how to keep that ball out of the air, you know, how to stay on top of it. I had a machine that I would put like 50 feet away. It was one of those iron mics. You remember the iron yeah. mic where the, the hand comes over? You fill it with balls and the hand comes over. I would stand... 25, 30 feet away and learn to hit that ball the other way, staying on top of that ball. This ball, I'm going to take it, I'm going to pull it. This ball, I'm going to take it, I'm going to hit it over here. But it was, it was doing those things like standing in front of that machine 15, 20 feet away and, and learning how to stay on top of that ball coming in there at, at 85, 90 miles an hour. And this is the beginning of Whitey Ball. Yes. Right? And it's get on base, steal a base, get a guy over, get him in. This is and you're playing on the carpet in a big stadium. Whitey had done this in Kansas City. Big ballpark, very spacious ballpark, so he had to have people who could, who could run, people who could uh, play what people call small ball, but I think it's just baseball the way baseball should be played. You know, you've got to be able to, to get a runner over, get a runner in. We don't see it as, as much today, you know, because we're trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark, but it's, it's that type of consistency of, of having guys who have good overall team speed, they can catch the baseball, and they can throw it. And what he tried to do is get 
nine of those guys playing on the, on the same field. So in 1982, you make the playoffs. You're in the NLCS. There was no wild card stuff no. back then. It's a three game, best out of five. Mm -hmm. How was it different? You know, this is your first time in the postseason as a big leaguer. As players, believe it or not, we, we question whether or not we are as good as we think we are. And when you're put into a situation, when you get traded for a player the caliber of a Gary Templeton, there's a lot of pressure because I couldn't put myself or, or make myself feel that I was the offensive player that Gary Templeton was because there was very few people that could get 200 hits from, from both sides, 100 hits from both sides of the plate and, and stuff. So I, I just concentrated on what it was that I did. I it reverted back to what Alvin Dark told me when I first made it to the big leagues. You just do what you do. You pick that ball up and you throw it across that diamond and, and things are going to work out, and they did. Chambliss hits it in the air to left center field. And the St. Louis Cardinals have won the 1982 National League pennant. And they did it with their pitching. And they did it with their speed. And they did it with bat manipulation the way they've done it all year long. A team torn apart and put together by that man, Whitey Herzog, cut in his own mold. And throughout this series, they have played Whitey Ball. And then we get to the World Series, and we play the Milwaukee Brewers, who was Harvey's wall bangers. They hit more home runs than anybody in the history of... Uh, uh, Could not have been a more diverse, uh, diverse Right, we teams. hit 67 home runs. They hit 200 and whatever. And so they, the first game that we played, they beat us 11 to nothing. Willie McGee was living with me at the time, and I can remember riding back home. He said, Will, this was embarrassing. I said, this was really, really embarrassing. And I said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we've got to figure out a way. And what we did is we were looking at scouting reports, and the scouting reports was, would tell us that we played a guy over here, so we played a guy over here, he hit it over there. They say play here, he hit it over there. So we were all, like, out of position. So what we ended up doing was getting rid of the scouting report and said, let's just play our game. We can't worry about what it is they do. Let's just play our game the way we know how to play it. We got rid of scouting reports, and our guys went out, and we said, hey, if we keep the game close, we got a chance. A swing and a miss, and that's the winner. And the Cardinals have won the 1982 World Series, the final score, six to three. Won the World Championship in 1982, and that was a great, that was a great accomplishment. Yeah. You just said that was a great accomplishment, I, that, and it, it was. I mean, it, it proved everything Whitey was selling you. Mm -hmm. What was it like back home? How did, how did the family react to having a world champion in the house? You know, it was, as you can imagine, uh, Joe, because it's like we all won. You know, everybody won, and, and I don't have to tell you how special it was for the city of St. Louis because we have some of the most rabid fans in the world. Hadn't won a championship, a championship since 67 prior 67 to 67. And, and we've had many guests who talk about we won it all and then it was hard to keep the edge. edge. Yeah. It was Did hard. you sense that? Yeah, it was hard coming back. And especially when you taste success like that. Uh, you, you, you know what it takes, but you still, you got to have the right ingredients. And I think for a lot of teams, what happens is they start, you win and then you start taking it apart to see if you, I guess to see if you could do it another way. And uh, we, start, we started getting rid of pieces to this, to this puzzle, and all of a sudden we found ourselves in this, in this period of time where we couldn't get it all together. And then uh, three, three years later, 1985, came back together again. So a couple things happened in 85. You have the Rookie of the Year on your team and Vince Coleman. You have the MVP and Willie McGee. But you also, diving back into a bag, suffer a tear in your rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. And and you played for 11 more years with a tear in there. Yeah. And the reason that I, I, I didn't get it fixed, first of all, I had a teammate, Lonnie Smith, who had one of these most vicious scars where he had torn his rotator cuff and it was a real ugly scar. Um, that, that really scared me. And then I knew Rick Burleson. And Rick Burleson, who played for the Boston Red Sox, hard worker, very good shortstop tore his rotator cuff and was never really able to come back. So I didn't want to get cut on. So I had to do something to strengthen the area around it to protect it. 
So in 1985, I met a guy by the name of Mackie Shillstone. Mackie Shillstone took Michael Spinks from a light heavy to a heavyweight. He worked with Riddick Bowe. He currently works with Serena Williams. And it was through working with Mackie that I learned how to build that area up around it to protect that rotator cuff. And so it's things that I take with me now that I was able to learn from Mackie that had allowed me to play from 1985 to 1996 with a torn rotator cuff. Now, it took, you know, some of the other skills and stuff that I had, learning to throw from here. Using the carpet. Using the carpet. You're, you're, Bouncing my, it when you had my to. My quickness. All of those things all came into play once I tore my rotator cuff because it didn't allow me to get up here, which I can now. And I, I didn't get it done until it started affecting my golf game. Yeah. I mean, that's the real story. That's the real, that's, that's the real story. I, I, did, I don't remember but, you getting paid $2 million no, to play golf. No, I, I didn't, but uh, that was a, a trying time. But when people ask me what is my greatest accomplishment, I say that that is my greatest accomplishment. Getting around the tear. You're getting around the tear, playing around the tear. How about the accomplishment of in that 85 NLCS being down two games to nothing yeah. against a really good Dodger team that was well put together? Mm -hmm. you got to be thinking we are in a deep hole. Yeah, we were in a deep hole because we hadn't played very well in Los Angeles all year. Um, and so when you get down to a team like that with the pitching that they had, you know, it, it wasn't good. So when we went back home, we knew we had to win three games to give ourselves a chance to come back, come back west. You win game three, you win game four, you're tied in the bottom of the ninth. Ozzie Smith steps to the plate in a 2-2 game, had never hit a home run in the big leagues left-handed. Still wasn't trying. <laughs> and this happened. One out in the second and didn't score. Smith corks one into right down the line. It may go. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. It's a home run, and the Cardinals have won the game by the score of three to two, and a home run by the Wizard. <laughs> Your dad, you know, your dad with, with the call. And, and you know, now, I, I don't know how true this is. You got to tell me. Did he think he missed it? Uh, he thought the call was ridiculous. That was my dad's voice on there. Yeah. And he, he stopped at the end of it, and everybody's going nuts. And he turned to the guy who was working with, and he said, I don't know why I just said that. That was awful. <laughs> he, and I listen, it still gives me chills. Yeah. So you go to the World Series 1985. in 1985 against the Kansas City Royals, mm -hmm. uh, same state, cross the state, and this is a World Series that lives in infamy in St. Louis because you've got a lead in the ninth inning in game six, a chance to close it out, one to nothing, Todd Worrell on the mound. We had not lost a game with the lead into the eighth inning all year. And a play happens at first base. The call. The call. Oh. Little swimmer to the right side. Worrell races over to cover. The throw doesn't get him. Worrell got to the bag in an argument here, and here comes Herzog. That, you know, that to me was, uh, I don't know. I, you know, we've let it go now, but we hung on to this for a long time because we, we feel we could have had another ring had there been instant replay at the time. Um, you know, but they, at the time, they didn't really talk about it, and that's why the manager and, and the pitcher both got kicked out because they didn't even, they didn't even converse about the call. And if you, you take a look at it, it's very clear Whoa. that, you know, the guy was out, but, you know, that's the way it goes. Let's take a look from this one. Yeah. Well, there it is. That's uh, Don Denkinger's the first base umpire. He, you know, yep. he, he missed the call, he and missed it. and that's part of being human. Now there's instant replay in the game, yeah. which to me has been a, a, a much needed improvement in the game. I think originally when instant replay was, was talked about, it was to, to determine whether or not the ball was fair or foul, whether it went over the fence. I think that what we have done we're overusing instant replay because it does take the human element out of it. Think about this. One of the fun parts of watching a baseball game was watching the antics that go on. 
And one of the antics was watching an Earl Weaver go out there and kick dirt. It was watching Lou Pinella almost pull a hamstring trying to <laughs> kick his cap. Or, or watching a Tom Lasorda go out and argue with the umpire. That's part of what made the game great. Well, now with instant replay, all of that's taken away. You don't have that same, you, you, you don't have that same type of intensity. But in you would have another ring, theoretically, if there was instant replay in 1985. I, I probably would have, but that doesn't change the way that I look at instant replay today. Yeah, that would have been great to, to have instant replay. Back then, all we, all we would have had was, and all we were asking for was them to even converse to see if another guy saw it, had a better angle. They didn't do that. If they had done that, then that would have You could have lived with it easier. You could have lived with it easier if that had been the case. But, you know, I, I think the, the um, today we're, we're kind of overusing it because it, it takes away some of the color of the game. And we don't have that anymore. You did excite and entertain. So this kid who was doing flips uh, off an <laughs> inner tube into <laughs> sawdust. Yeah. Took that, and it first happened with the Padres, but you brought the tradition to St. Louis. Opening day, end of the year, flip, backflip. In spring training in 1978, we had to run two miles after we finished working out. Well, I wasn't too fond of running. I could run fast, but, you know, it was more sprints. I didn't like long distances. And so um, I was near the back of the pack, and I had Gene Tennis, Raleigh Fingers, Gaylord Perry, Dave Winfield. They, they weren't getting, enjoying the running either. No, they weren't. Guys. They weren't. But, you know, they were complaining that I was near the back of the pack and I was the youngest guy. And so to show them that I wasn't tired, I did my round off back. Boom. Gene Tennis had girls that were in the gymnastics. And he said, man, I'd love to, my girls to see you do that. Well, we were never able to do it during the course of the season. So Fan Appreciation Day, which was the last day of the season, he says to me, you know, it would be great for you to do that going out to the position. I go, man, are you crazy? This is the chicken's town. San Diego, San Diego chicken, chicken was the mascot. Ted Gil Newless. And, and I said, no, that would, you know, I, I don't want to try and show the chicken up. But anyway, they talk me into it, and I do it. And people liked it so much, they asked me to do it opening day the following year, and lo and behold, it became my trademark. <laughs> now it's that thing where little old ladies come up to me, and they go, we know who you are. You're that, you're that guy that does the flip. I go, I played baseball, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 1987's a big year for you. You're a 300 hitter, uh -huh. and you win the Silver Slugger Award. That is a major accomplishment for you. That was big. Uh, that was big because, as, as I told you, my goal was to win a gold glove, and, and eventually that goal became to win myself a si Silver Slugger Award. And, I was able to accomplish that. I would have liked to have done that a little bit more, but I, 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 I guess the fact that I was able to win that one was very, very special for me because it, it meant that I, uh, I had set a goal and, and I was able to accomplish it. In 1990, though, Whitey Herzog shocks everybody, at least on the outside, mm -hmm. when he walks away almost dead middle of the season. You guys are in San Diego, uh, ironically yeah. enough. And Whitey Herzog says, that's it, I'm out. Yeah. I, I think that he realized and he was told at the time that the team was, was going in a different direction. And being the architect that he was, um, he didn't see that as being a way for us to continue uh, on the same journey that we were on. So you're sensing that, that he was getting from above pressure to either A, do it differently, or B, get out. And, and from what he said, he talked a lot about long-term contracts and that athlete of the day was more worried about making the next big deal than what he sold you on, which was get a guy over, give yourself up, get him in. The, the game had really changed. The dynamics of the game was starting to change and he realized that it was starting to change. And having been the general manager and the manager at the same time, you know, he had the ability to to, to do things the way he wanted them done and a way that he understood and he realized that the organization was changing the way uh, they weren't thinking along the same lines that he was thinking so he felt that it was time to get out. Well now Joe Torre comes in. Mm -hmm. You're 35 years old yeah. and there's a little bit of the respect stuff coming back in because first week that Joe Torre is there you're lifted for a pinch hitter mm -hmm. and that doesn't sit well with you. That didn't sit well with me because I want to win. 
And I wanted to be that guy at the plate, and I think I had proven myself from an offensive standpoint that I could deal with those situations. And, uh, and not given that opportunity, um, you know, it was very frustrating for me. By the time Joe was finished, mm -hmm. were you too okay? Oh, yeah, no, we're, no we're, we're, we're fine. I mean, it's all part of being competitive. And I think Joe realized that having been a player, it, it, was, it was just one of those moments that when you're, when you're competing, it's, it's, it's tough to deal with when somebody says, well, I don't have enough confidence in you. I'm going to let somebody else do it. And I didn't feel that at that time that my skill and talent had deteriorated to the point that I wasn't going to be effective at the plate as I had been. Getting back to respecting the game, I, res I think that I had proven to that point that I respected the game to the point that I was not going to be a guy that was hold hanging on. I think that anybody that ever knew me knew that I respected the game so much to the point that I was not going to be out there to where you had to push me around in a wheelchair and you know, if I couldn't get to this ball here or that. Now, at 35, I wasn't going to be the same player or cover as much ground as I did as I was 25. I understand that, and I wasn't going to be able to play 160 games at 35, but certainly I could play anywhere from 40 to 50 games and still be effective enough to help this team win. And so um, I thought I had proven that uh, I respected the game enough to where I would not disrespect it by going out there and, and being subpar. So then walk me through the Tony La Russa situation. There's no way you can sit here and I, I don't ask you about that. Well, he, I, just, just to set it up, he okay. shows up in 1996, you're 41. Yeah. They make a deal for a, a young shortstop, Royce Clayton, and now you and Royce are there together. You've got the great Ozzy Smith who's going to go in the Hall of Fame, and then this kid who's a really good young player and a new manager. He, he said the, the best player is going to play. Between you and Royce? Between me and Royce. He said, the guy that, that plays the best is going to be the player. I said, well, Tony, I said, I got no problem with that. And so uh, going into spring training, I had a better spring. Than Royce? And, than Royce. And um, I think I pulled a hamstring or something in, in uh, one of the last exhibition games that we played. And uh, that was really kind of the, the opening for allowing Royce to be the opening day shortstop. And uh, that story kind of went on and went on forever and stuff. But, um, you know, when I realized that this was going to be, this could get really, really ugly. And I didn't want, here again, I respected the game enough. I knew that it was time for me to move on. And so I announced my retirement. It was an unfortunate time because everybody would like to finish it the way that they want to finish it. Sure. And I, I certainly wanted to, to finish differently than it did, but it was what it was. And so I, I put it behind me, and it's just one of those incidents that happened. 2,460 hits. That's how many the all-glove, no bat, <laughs> Osborne, Earl Smith ended with in the big leagues. That's more than Mickey Mantle. That's more than Joe DiMaggio. 2,460 hits for a guy who had to make himself into a big league hitter. Now, that was a mountain that you climbed. Let me, let me say this here, Joe. And, and, I, and I talked about this earlier. When you're playing every day and you're doing your thing, statistics don't, they don't really mean anything. The only thing that's important is whether or not you helped your team win. In my 19 years, I always ask myself at the end of every game, did you do the best you could today? This was one of those things when I was in college. You know, it was always the question that I had to ask myself every day. Did you do the best you could today? And that answer for 19 years in the big leagues was yes. Now, that didn't mean we won every day. That didn't mean that I, you know, I did all of the things that I wanted to do. But I know that I didn't take anything for granted, and I didn't leave anything out there. I worked extremely hard to be the very best that I could be. And when I look back at it now, you know, I know that I did the very best with what I was blessed with. And so I... I just consider myself very fortunate, very lucky to have had the opportunity to play this wonderful game for 19 years. And um, I wouldn't trade it. You know, if I go back, I wouldn't change a thing because it was all part of my, my journey. It was all part of the learning experience. And um, it got me to this.
Before the fun questions, what's next for you? What's what's next down well, the uh, the yellow brick road? Well, we recently opened the Ozzie Smith iMac Regeneration Center in St. Louis, and we do PRP, we do stem cell, we do COP, we do pain management. And so it's been one of the most fascinating things for me because when you have someone who has not walked, has been paralyzed for three years, and they get up out of that chair, and they're able to walk, it's one of the greatest feelings of accomplishment. It's the greatest feeling of wow. So when you're, able to touch, when you're able to touch lives like that, that's real. That's real, and that's, uh, that's my newest endeavor. Well, good for you. And we've been open 103 days. <laughs> yeah. But who's counting? Who's counting? Yeah. All right, fun questions. Here we go. This is how we close. Would you rather be a master of every musical instrument or fluent in every language? You know what? I think I'd rather be fluent in all languages. And I say that because communicating with people, being able to communicate with people and... Um, and understand, I, so, so I think it would be the languages, be able to speak those languages. Think how popular you would be at a party, though, if you could <laughs> play every instrument. Yeah. That'd be nice. But... Somebody drag the bagpipes out of the back. <laughs> Ozzy's going to play the bagpipes. <laughs> yeah, right. Would you rather find a snake in your bed in the middle of the night? Oh, no. Or a dozen oh, no. spiders? Oh. Neither. Oh. You I have to pick. It. I have to pick. There's no getting off the hook here. See, spiders. Spiders? Yeah. No snakes. I don't like, you know, I'm a brother, man. I, brothers don't like snakes. <laughs> brothers don't like snakes, man. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Would you rather dance every time you walk or sing every time you talk? I like to dance. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'd like to dance. I'm a dancer. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a man here who experienced the Watts riots in 1965, was all glove, no bat, Matt. fought his way into Major League Baseball, ended up with over 2,400 hits, a world champion, a first ballot Hall of Famer, and a hell of a man. The Wizard of Oz, Ozzie Smith. Yeah.